Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd and this is my review of episode 6 of season 4 of Star Trek Discovery called Stormy Weather, or as I would call it, the return of the space sonar. And it was even stupider this time than in all the previous times in which the show is often suggesting there are sounds in space. But at least in the previous times they were kind of talking about radiation and crystal resonance and all kinds of nonsense that you can say maybe they're not actually talking about sound waves in space. But in this episode they literally mean sound waves in space. And it's even worse this time because they are stuck in a void which is completely empty of anything according to their own dialogue. And yet they are sending sound waves in this emptiness and then they get it bounced back to them and that's how they hear all kinds of things they need and so it was even stupider this time because you know in normal space there are some particles there is some bit of gas maybe in some regions more than others so you can say maybe some form of a sound wave could work and be picked up by their super sensitive equipment but in this episode they go into a void which they say is completely devoid of anything at all and then they try to literally listen to their surroundings and they are surprised to hear nothing so it's like in normal space they do hear things in space apparently and in the end they send a literal sonar wave and get it bounced back at them and that's how they know the location and all of that so it was just absolutely stupid without even any way to try to explain it away. It's like they're deliberately trolling us. They're deliberately doubling down on that idea to piss us off even more. Like they're deliberately trying to be stupid. So it does almost make me laugh, but uh, I think it's more sad than funny because especially annoying is the fact that this episode did have potential to do good things, but they messed it up because of details like that. It totally takes me out of it. And also the missed opportunity, the fact that uh, they had the perfect setup in this episode to finally explain that short track called Calypso, which was probably the only good short track episode. But it was always annoying to me how it never fit in anywhere in the timeline of the show, even though it's supposedly about the same ship. And now we have the same uh, computer, Zora, running the ship, just like in that short track. So I keep expecting them to somehow tie into that, which would be very difficult because of their own mistakes in their own continuity. For example, in the short track, the ship looks like it did uh, back in the previous seasons before they jumped to the future, before the retrofit. It didn't have the letter A on it yet. So how can they possibly explain that? Uh, and so this episode actually had the perfect setup in this episode. So for a moment, I thought they are being clever. For a moment, I was about to praise them. Oh, so how, that's how they will explain it. That's actually kind of brilliant. That's actually very clever how they will explain that short track and where it fits inside the show. But then they totally missed it. They totally blew it. And then I almost banged my head into the wall because of the stupidity of the missed opportunity itself. And so disappointing is not a strong enough word to explain my feelings about this episode, especially because I was actually enjoying the beginning of the episode. I was uh, thinking this might finally be a good episode uh, of a science fiction show because it had the kind of stuff that I personally always enjoyed in episodes in which they had some kind of mystery or when they encounter some unknown strange uh, thing in space or they got trapped somehow with some you know, horror elements the mystery of it and so episodes like uh, that episode with Nagilo when they went into that void and got stuck there because it's like some other dimension if they go into one direction they get out of the other side and so it's like a clever science fiction idea and the mystery of it all and all of that so those are the kind of episodes I really loved uh, in TNG and this episode of Discovery began in the same way so they go into the subspace rupture that was left over after that anomaly disappeared to try to get more information even though it's silly how for the whole season they're just gathering data about the anomaly and they still didn't get anywhere they still know nothing about it for so many episodes in which each time they discover something which is supposedly significant and yet it still doesn't really solve anything and they don't really know anything so anyway they fly into that hole that was left after the anomaly disappeared to try to get more information the only thing that kind of annoyed me is how they intentionally fly right into it, not knowing anything at all about it. Why not send a shuttle in first? Why not send probes in? Why not make sure you can get out of it before you fly your most important ship in the entire fleet into this unknown anomaly, not knowing if you can get out or not? And it's like they have a super overconfidence in this show. They're so sure they will be able to spur jump out of there and they're so sure they will survive. It's like they're aware of their own plot armor and they're so overconfident 
that it's like stupidity. If this was actually happening, it would be the most stupid thing ever. You have shutters, you have 200 shutters, we saw that in the end of season 2. You have probes, you have weapons, why don't you use any of these uh, things? Why are you flying your most important ship? The only ship in the galaxy with a working spore drive and you're willing to sacrifice it so easily without any precautions and I did mention all the previous Star Trek shows that they often got stuck in such anomalies but it was never intentionally, it was usually by accident or uh, in the case of that episode with Nagilom they didn't just fly into that space hole, they were simply approaching it to study it, they were sending in probes trying to scan it and so on and then it moved to them and then it sucked them in so it was not their intention to just blindly fly the whole ship into it and yet in this episode that's how they do it they just fly the ship right into this unknown anomaly not knowing anything at all what's on the other side and then they get stuck there and unable to leave so it was stupid right from the start, but I was enjoying the whole unknown mystery and the horror element of it all, so there's absolutely nothing in that entire region of space, and they're unable to spore jump out of there, and it's funny how they try to get Book to jump them out of there, and then Book gets uh, electrified by something, and then he has visions of his father and all kinds of nonsense which I did not enjoy, his father was a really annoying character, and uh, you know the problem with the show is that they always kind of over exaggerate all these kinds of things, all this uh, drama between characters, it's always so over the top that it becomes annoying, you know it could have been good scenes of him talking with his dead father, not knowing if he's real or not, and all of those elements could have worked and provided some backstory and all of that, so it could have been good, but they just go so hard with it, making his father such an annoying asshole that it's not pleasant to hear this kind of dialogue, like he just berates him, he says, oh, you're with that woman, you take orders from that woman, all of that, you know, all those elements of him being a toxic male and all of that, so it's just annoying, it's so over the top, it's so unpleasant and so all of that just felt like annoying filler it didn't go anywhere it's not uh, serving any kind of purpose and uh, why didn't they first test the spore jump to see if it will work or not in the first season of the show they didn't yet use the uh, human pilots to do these jumps they were just using the ship's computer i think which was able to do short range uh, jumps they could jump you know a few kilometers in all kinds of direction without any kind of uh, conscious pilot so why not use that to get out of that hole and it's silly how they assumed it would even work if they're in some other dimension, some other region of subspace, which is damaged or whatever, what makes them think it will even work, I have no idea, they're just so reliant on their spore network, that it always works in any universe, in any layer of reality, it always works, so they're so confident it will, and that makes them kind of stupid, why make those kinds of assumptions? So anyway, they send one of those droids outside the ship to try to see what's out there, and then it gets eaten alive by something in the emptiness, which was kind of creepy, and uh, I remember I predicted these kinds of scenes when these uh, robots first appeared, and I saw their cute big eyes, and I immediately knew there were going to be scenes in which uh, these uh, cute robots will be horribly butchered and murdered by something, and we had uh, a scene like that in the previous season as well, when... Uh, one of the robots sacrificed itself to save Mrs. T and uh, it got destroyed by radiation or something and I knew there was going to be scenes like that, uh, like in that movie Short Circuit in which there was a cute robot which got horribly beaten up by people and its eye got broken and all of that so I predicted there's going to be scenes like that here because I kind of know the style of the show by now I know they love to have all kinds of gruesome death scenes and all of that so they send the cute little robot out into the emptiness where it gets eaten alive by something and we can hear it screaming. It literally is screaming out into space and they hear it of course because there's sound in space even inside voids with absolute emptiness because the writers don't know how sound works. And so the robot is screaming in pain as it's being eaten alive. At least this moment did kind of work as a horror element because suddenly they're all nervous, suddenly they realize that this region of space is kind of toxic and they even say whatever is out there is approaching the ship and it's closing down on the ship and uh, so that's going to be their fate as well. So I did kind of like that because I am a fan of uh, science fiction horror and all of those uh, kinds of things. So I was actually enjoying the episode and that whole creepy factor of it and they show kind of they zoom out of the ship and they show the ship in absolute emptiness and so there's some suspense and so I was actually enjoying the beginning of the episode because it reminded me all those uh, episodes with strange horrifying anomalies and mystery episodes uh, like in Star Trek TNG especially 
They also say that whatever infected Book's brain uh, has some particles which can only be found in the galactic barrier. So that was a nice reference back to TOS in which they were always talking about the galactic barrier with strange particles which was kind of forgotten in all the other Star Trek shows. You know in TNG they did travel to other galaxies and back and they never mentioned any galactic barrier. So maybe they found a way to get uh, through it in the 24th century. So anyway, it's mentioned here as well. And so this uh, threat that created the DMA anomaly is apparently from some other galaxy, which is uh, fine, I guess. And at least they finally discover something about it, because so far for six episodes, they know absolutely nothing about any of this. So now they're trying to get out of this uh, void and uh, they cannot simply go backward because uh, th they were stupid enough not to send the shuttle first to make sure they can go back. So now they're stuck here and unable to navigate because they cannot see anything anywhere and they cannot hear anything. They're trying to listen to the outside and cannot hear anything and they're surprised by it because I guess in normal space they can hear things. And then Mr. No Response suddenly remembers about the space sonar from season one and he suggests using the sonar to try to find some of those exotic particles out there because they resonate at sonar frequency you know from all the frequencies in the universe the only frequency that the particles will respond to is sonar frequencies because i guess sonar is the only thing the writers know about someone in the writer's room really loves the word sonar they really love the idea of the sonar and so they use a literal sonar wave to detect where the particles are and uh, it bounces back to the ship and then they know where to fly and that's how they get out of the anomaly. So anyway, to get back to normal space, they have to pass uh, through some plasma something something and uh, it will cause friction with the hole. And it will heat up the ship. So the only way the crew can survive is by storing everyone inside transporter buffers, which was another clever reference to that episode of TNG called Relics in which Scotty got to the future by hiding inside the transporter buffer. Basically, he was saved in the ship's computer using the transporter, which is an interesting science fiction idea, so I didn't mind that at all. And the fact that they show that the ship is burning up and all of that, I thought that would be a clever way to explain why the ship will look like its older version, because maybe all the programmable matter and all of that will be destroyed. And maybe when it comes out of the anomaly, it will be in the past. And maybe that's why the ship will have to hide somewhere until it gets to the future in the normal way. And then uh, the computer will get the crew out of the transporter buffer. And so I thought they're setting that up. I thought it's going to be a clever way to explain that short track. But then they totally blew it. They missed the opportunity again. They had the perfect setup to explain everything that we saw in that short track, because what did we see? We saw the ship hiding in some nebula. It looked like the old version of the ship and the crew was completely gone. And Zora said that she was waiting for a thousand years. And so I thought that when the ship leaves uh, that hole, it's going to discover that it's somewhere in the past. And maybe, you know, in the case that someone finds it, uh, the ship maybe doesn't want to look like a future ship. So maybe that's why it will disguise itself as a ship of the same time period is where it came from, something clever like that, that's what I expected. But they missed the opportunity and then they just come out of the anomaly and uh, they get fixed back immediately to how it was and uh, that's it. So what was the point of all of this? And uh, it's also silly how Michael stays on the bridge even though the whole ship is burning up, but of course it's not a big deal for Michael because you know she can survive the vacuum of space, she's totally fearless, she has the thickest plot armor that we've ever seen in any show ever, and so of course she can simply stay on the bridge as everything is burning, and the ship's computer sings her a song to calm her down. And speaking of surviving in space, there was a scene in this episode of a crew member who happens to be a white man who gets sucked out into space, and I joked previously how uh, the white man are the new red shirts in the show. In every single episode, there's a scene of a white man who gets brutally killed somehow. It's always a white man who gets killed. And it happens again in this episode, so that kind of made me laugh, because again, that's one of those predictable patterns of the show. So when it happens again, it's kind of funny. So he gets sucked out into space, and then they just announce him dead. No one is trying to save him. I mean, they do have transporters, they do have sensors, so why can't they simply beam that guy back? Especially since they established just a few episodes ago that you can actually survive in the vacuum of space without any problem. Michael did it just a few episodes ago. And they're not even trying to save him. If they had the quick line of saying, uh, I don't know, he got ripped apart by some debris outside and he's dead uh, without uh, any ability to revive him, fine. But they never even try. It's like they give up on him completely. Oh, that guy got sucked out. Oh, that's too bad. I feel sad now. 
and the ship's computer is feeling sad because she's the one who closed the force field on him and then not using the super advanced transporters to try to simply beam him back to the ship no one even tries that and then the computer is sad about having to sacrifice that man and it's so sad and everyone is so emotional and the ship's computer is super emotional and you know the whole thing with the ship's computer being sentient and all of that i'm totally fine with that that's a classic science fiction idea that's a good idea but the way they're doing it in the show it's as always it's all over exaggerated with emotions and the computer is talking just like michael with whispers and i'm so emotional i'm so sad about all of this and maybe the worst part of the episode is when uh, Gray is trying to cheer up the computer. Gray is playing some kind of chess game with the computer and that somehow allows the computer to figure out things. And so Gray is actually useful somehow. You know, I joked in the previous review, I said that uh, Gray is the most useless character ever. What is her job on the ship exactly? She's doing absolutely nothing. She just hangs around the ship's bar, which uh, once again, the show, it has a Ferengi and a Morn in the bar always the Ferengi bartender and the moron type of alien they are together in the bar always so that's kind of a homage to deep space nine which is fine but it's happening in every single episode that we see the bar it's always the Ferengi and always the moron type of alien together in the bar always so that's kind of funny as well and so Grey is just hanging in the bar all day long and everyone goes on duty and she stays there alone but then she saves the day because she's the only one who is able to cheer up the ship's computer which is depressed and sad and emotional and all of that and it's like talking with whispers the ship's computer is always like this oh I'm so emotional now captain I developed organic feelings without explanation I'm so sad now captain why don't you trust me captain and <laughs> Why is anyone supposed to trust the same? Isn't that the same sphere data that supposedly was going to end all life in the galaxy when it was about to merge with the control AI and then they were going to wipe out the whole galaxy and all of that? So why wouldn't people be worried about the same exact sphere data that caused all of that disaster now becoming sentient again? Why wouldn't it be worrisome? Why would they allow it to simply control the most uh, advanced ship in the fleet and all of that? So why wouldn't they be worried about it? Everyone seems to totally accept it as some kind of character and it suddenly developed human emotions and uh, Gray is able to cheer it up and able to help the computer become more focused or some stupid stuff like that. And meanwhile, Book is talking with the ghost of his dead father. And what is it with the show with characters always talking with dead people? Like first it was Adira talking with the dead Gray ghost. And everyone thinking that was totally normal. Now Book is talking with his dead father and everyone thinks it's totally normal. So what is it with the show of characters constantly talking with dead people? And what is it with the show with every single character there's some kind of tragic backstory? First it was Michael losing her parents. And then Book lost his entire family and is depressed. Then in the previous episode there was uh, Mr. Reese uh, revealing that his whole uh, town was wiped out by a hurricane somehow. And now Mrs. T is telling that uh, her best friend died when she was a child. Like every single character has some kind of tragic backstory. Maybe that's why they all need therapy. The, you know, in the previous episode, a few episodes ago, the show that every single member of the crew needs uh, therapy sessions with uh, the new counsel Troy, which is Dr. Colbert, who somehow became a psychologist suddenly, even though he himself is kind of crazy because he came back to life. And then Grey came back to life in a convoluted way. And now Book's father came back to life as a ghost. Why don't they put him inside the robot body and bring him back to life as they previously did with uh, Grey? So anyway, to save the crew, they have to put everyone inside a transporter buffer. And then Michael tells them, everyone go in in groups. None of them should go in alone. And then uh, they get into small groups and they all hold hands and then they beam into the transporter buffer together somehow for some reason. Why the hell would they need to go in in groups and hold each other hands to be there? Like, uh, are they going to be aware of what's happening when they are stored in the buffer? Like, uh, is it supposed to be comforting to hold each other's hands while they are in the transporter storage? Like, what the hell kind of sense does that make? What do you mean no one should go in alone? What difference does it make? Why should they hold each other's hands? Like it's another example of the show kind of trying too hard to be over emotional and over uh, dramatic. So of course it's an emotional moment. Of course they all have to hold each other's hands to go into the buffer. Like what the hell is going on here? None of this makes any kind of sense at all. None of the show makes sense. And then the ship is burning and only Michael Burnham is able to survive it. 
And uh, there's not even any point of her being on the bridge, like she's not actually doing anything. Why isn't she being put into the transporter buffer, at least uh, in that point of the episode, when uh, there's no point for her staying on the bridge, you know, she loses consciousness, so that's the point. But at least it has the unintended side effect of making us laugh, at least it's kind of unintentional comedy because of how stupid all of this was. And it gives me materials to make a lot of funny compilations and uh, videos about all the ridiculous stuff in the show. So at least it's something. So that's why, you know, I keep watching. Some people say, if you hate it so much, why do you keep watching? And the answer is because it is kind of entertaining to poke fun at it. It is funny to laugh at it. And therefore it does have some kind of entertainment value. So that's my opinion on this episode. Let me know what you think and we can discuss all of this in the comments below. And I will see you all next time. Bye bye.